Hi there. Welcome back to Coffee with Conlon. I've got my mug, and I hope you have yours. And today, our questions are all about Ludwig van Beethoven and uh, Giacomo Puccini. Now that, those are strange bedfellows, but they are both celebrating birthdays this week. Beethoven on the December 17th, and he is 250 years old. And Giacomo Puccini, born in 1858 on the 22nd of December, and uh, that makes him 152 years old. But, so happy birthday to both of them, of course. And so all the questions that were sent in this week had to do with either Beethoven or Puccini, and most interesting and intriguing, both of them at the same time. And that's a combination which is very challenging and sort of fun because I would never imagine mentioning these two composers in the same breadth. So if you go to opposite extremes of the universe, you're going to come up with their names and their music. Now, it's quite normal to talk about Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven, or after Beethoven, Beethoven, Schubert, Schumann, Brahms, Wagner, and it's normal to talk about, I guess, Giuseppe Verdi and Puccini and maybe the bel canto composers, but that's a little distance. But never do you find an instance, I think, where you talk about the two of them in the same breath. So the, the questions are really interesting. And um, let me uh, take advantage of their differences more than their similarities. This first question is from Julia. If Puccini had had the time to write the finale of Turandot, what do you think it would have been? As you may know, he, he died prematurely and had made it halfway through the last act. In fact, the death of Liu is where Puccini stopped writing. And Arturo Toscanini, who conducted the premiere, stopped the first performance there and turned to the audience and said, it is here that the master put down his pen. So what happened? The opera had to be finished. Uh, it was finished by a contemporary composer at the time named Alfano, and he wrote a finale. We don't know that. We don't usually hear that finale. We think we're hearing it. And this has become the, this has become the traditional end of Turndot. But the fact is we're hearing Alfano with cuts by Toscanini. Toscanini cut uh, quite a bit of it. So that's what we usually hear. Now, there are performances of Alfano. There have been other completed Turndot's uh, Luciano Berio, for instance, finished it, finished the work, and others have done the same. So, what would he have done? Well, we only know that he probably would have followed the same text and the same libretto and would have finished it in that manner. But, of course, you can never really know what a composer would have written. Recently, a friend of mine, a member of the Chicago Symphony, who was a great musician, wrote to me and said, you know, you live in Los Angeles and Los Angeles opera is your opera house. Why don't you commission a Los Angeles composer to finish Turandot? The difficulty in anybody refinishing it at the distance of now almost 100 years is that styles change, ears change, it's pretty hard to reproduce something that fits right into the the style so that it's not too much of an artistic break with the rest of the opera. And even a great composer like Luciano Berio, it's very difficult for a, a composer, a genius with a great identity, with a great personality, to actually mute that personality enough to make it uh, to make the connection seem natural. Now, even, even a great composer like Shostakovich, who completed versions, or I should say orchestrations of Mussorgsky's Boris Gudnov and Hovanchina, uh, at times it's difficult not to hear Shostakovich because his, uh, his trademark was so, so strong. So um, it's conjectural. What if, what if Puccini hadn't died? I guess 
we'll have to just keep asking that question. And thank you for that, Julia. What are your favorite recordings of Fidelio or of the Puccini operas? I would start with, I think there is a historic recording, which is very important for everybody to hear of La Boheme. It is the only recording that Arturo Toscanini made of any Puccini opera. Now, considering that he conducted the premiere and the premiere of quite a number of other Puccini operas, uh, I think nobody can argue with the authenticity of his approach. Now, I have heard people complain that it's very fast, and yes, it is, but we also know that Toscanini's tempi got faster as he got older, and this is a, a recording made relatively late. But I have heard people question its its approach. And I said, well, how can you question the approach of the man who conducted the premiere? So I do think that that's a very important one. I also say in my own personal life, the first LP of a complete opera I owned was La Boheme also. And this was conducted by Tullio Serafin, a very important uh, and in some respect under, not I wouldn't say underrated, but less talked about conductor from the era and with Renata Tebaldi and Carlo Bergonzi. This is a great recording. I love it. I love it largely also because it was the first recording I heard. But I have a very special weakness for Callas and Di Stefano and their recordings of just about all of the Puccini operas, certainly on the top of my list. Tosca, conducted by Victor de Sabata in particular. Fidelio uh, is a little different, I think, on the two artistic extremes. Once again, Toscanini with the NBC Symphony is a stunning recording. And I would also say that uh, Klemperer is recording very slow. If you like to talk about Tempe, Klemperer tends to be slow. Toscanini tends to be fast. But Otto Klemperer is recording. Uh, John Vickers, Christa Ludwig is a special favorite of mine. But that being said, I haven't re-listened to Fidelio's recently, so I might change my mind if I heard something else at this point. What was your first live experience of Beethoven, of Puccini? My first experience hearing Beethoven live, if I can remember correctly, I would have been 12, 13. I remember hearing the Pastoral Symphony in Carnegie Hall in New York. I think we had gone with our class to hear it, and I remember particularly outstanding, I remember the storm that stood out in my mind uh, at that time. The first time I saw Fidelio, what I'd say maybe 15 years old, I remember it was in the old Metropolitan Opera, so that was before the fall of 1966. I remember in particular Birgit Nielsen. I heard more than one performance. I remember standing room only up at the top of the uh, family circle, I remember Carl Berm conducting. And those were the first performances of Fidelio that I will have heard. La Boheme is different. Uh, the first performance of La Boheme was, I was actually in it. I was uh, singing in the children's chorus and uh, I sang that whiny little boy in the second act who wants a toy, wants to buy a present from Parc Pignol. So that was me. That was my first, uh, the first time I was on a opera stage. I did sing for, for several years beyond that in children's choruses, including in, in Puccini's Tosca. The first performance I saw La Boheme from the audience would be, again, the Metropolitan Opera. Can't remember when. It was way back there in, in that era. Next, Boheme was a, La Boheme was for me a series of firsts. It was the opera that I conducted at Juilliard when I was 21, which uh, launched my professional career. I had taken that over at short notice. It was uh, only the second opera I conducted at the Metropolitan Opera in 1977. In, uh, it was the first opera of which I made a movie in Paris in 1975. And it was the first opera I conducted when I became chief conductor, principal conductor of the Paris Opera in 1975. 95. So that's my first Puccini and Beethoven. Now here in 
In many ways, probably the best question, because on the surface, it almost seems absurd. If you were making a program of Beethoven and Puccini, what would you do? Now, to start with, I probably never would make such a program. And you're, we're talking about here two composers who are at the opposite ends of the classical music universe. Uh, why do I say that? First, uh, let's let's list the ways in terms of their their national identity. Beethoven almost incorporates Germanic music, and Puccini, along with Verdi and Rossini, almost are the the pillars of Italian music. Very different. Beethoven wrote almost exclusively so-called absolute music or let's say at least instrumental music what are his great what are his great works they are symphonies they are string quartets they are piano sonatas yes he wrote songs yes he wrote choral music but he only wrote one opera and that opera is fidelio and he uh, toiled over it for 20 years puccini on the other hand wrote almost exclusively opera he once said that he couldn't write until he could actually see the scene in front of him and feel the drama. So he's written very little so-called absolute music. The most we have really is uh, the collection of intermezzos that he tended to write before the second half of some of his operas, Manon Lesco, or introductions to the third part of the third act. Adam Butterfly, uh, Tosca, but this really can't be excerpted except for Manuel Lesco. So he wrote virtually nothing of importance for orchestra and almost nothing at all for any form of chamber music. Puccini is primarily about in, in terms of his inspirations about drama, it's about theater. Beethoven is about, is if, if there is such a thing, pure music. It is about the form, the content, the substance that is fully contained without words. Puccini almost never writes without words. And then there's a question of taste. It'd sort of be like, well, I don't know. Uh, if you like steak, I don't. I don't eat much meat. But if you like steak and you love ice cream, if you were to put a big uh, scoop of ice cream right on your steak and eat them together, well, that's for me what it would be like actually even hearing uh, Beethoven and Puccini together. So I guess my answer to that is I wouldn't. That's just not a combination I, I can imagine doing. And if you put me to the wall and said, uh, we're going to shoot you if you don't come up with something, I'll have to keep thinking about what that would be. And here's another interesting question. If Beethoven theoretically could have learned something from Puccini, what would it have been? And conversely, what did Puccini learn from Beethoven? Let's start with the second, which is Puccini. Puccini of the Italian operatic composers was in many respects, the most European, the most international. He knew everything that was going on in contemporary music. He followed with great interest, all of the contemporary music, especially what was going on in Paris. He was an internationalist in his way. Now, there's no question that he studied Beethoven, just as everybody studied Beethoven. What it contributed to him is very hard to say, because it's very hard to find any direct traces in their styles. The most I could say is that occasionally he wrote little fugues or little pieces of counterpoint, but so had many other people. And so that's very hard. And you could also say he will have learned much more from Verdi, but because he was following this great giant in Italian music, he really had to strike out on his own after Verdi because nobody could match Verdi. 
Puccini was a young man. Verdi was a venerated older man. So he struck out on his own. And I would say the sources to look for there, the most important source is Wagner. So Wagner owes a lot to Beethoven. He cited as Beethoven as the greatest composer, as Shakespeare was the greatest poet, and he wanted to write music dramas that resembled in their way Beethoven and Shakespeare. That's indirectly of influence on Puccini, but not a very tangible one. So I would say you can't find much, you can't find much Puccini, you can't find much Beethoven in Puccini. You would have to go via Wagner and perhaps the Impressionist composers to really get anywhere along those lines. What would Beethoven theoretically have learned from Puccini? I would say about music, without being without seeming to disparage Puccini, I would say next to nothing. I don't think that there are any initiatives, musical innovations on the part of Puccini that would have any relevance to Beethoven. But there is one thing that part of Puccini's genius, which he had in spades, that did not come naturally to Beethoven was how to write for the stage and how to write a convincing, dramatic, lyrical opera. Beethoven toiled with Fidelio for 20 years. It had several revisions. It was first an opera called Leonora. He cut, he pasted, he moved things, he revised things, he tried again. And he came up with an opera that still to this day, some people feel is not a perfect opera. Now, how do I feel about that? is to say, well, I'm not interested in perfection. I'm interested in inspiration. And it is one of the most inspirational operas and just simply pieces of music that I know. I think Fidelio stands up very well without scenery and without a theater. I don't know how well Puccini does, not as well. If Beethoven had been able to move himself into the sense, the natural sense of theater and drama, he would have had an easier time. So consequently, I think Puccini, who said, you know, I can't write the music until I see the scenery or feel the scene or the feeling of the theater. If he had had just a little bit more of that, he would have eas had an easier time. Would he have written a better opera? I don't know. Fidelio is as good as they come as far as I'm concerned. Here's a timely question. Do you have an opera that serves as your personal holiday tradition? What operas are classically, quote unquote, holiday operas, in your opinion? Now, to answer a lot of that question, I'm going to send you to Conlon's Corner for my podcast, which is just about tradition, traditional music at Christmas. Why do we need traditions? Why do we practice them? And how can traditions change? So I'll, se I'll send you in that direction to answer that part of the question. One of the issues that I will address in that is why are there not more cri Christmas operas or why does Christmas seem to inspire oratorios or religious music more than dramatic music on the stage? First, there's a historical reason. Any depiction of New Testament works, and even to some degree some, uh, Old Testament works, was forbidden by the very powerful influence of the Christian churches in Europe. And so for many years, it was simply forbidden to put a biblical or a gospel story on the stage. Consequently, there are fewer operas. Now, uh, as a curiosity, I went to Wikipedia and found 40 names of operas that were associated with Christmas, but very few of which I had ever heard of or knew. Rimsky Korsakov had two. And uh, one of the ones that I remember from my childhood was Menotti's, Giancarlo Menotti's Amal on the Night Visitors, which was very popular and loved at the time and um, has fallen 
a little bit on neglect in more recent years. We occasionally see a scene from Christmas, but it really has nothing to do with Christmas. For instance, the second act of La Boheme is, uh, is depicted at the, uh, in the Latin Quarter of Paris at, on Christmas Eve. But that's really just decoration. Puccini decorates his operas beautifully with locales, Paris, uh, Nagasaki, ancient China, uh, the Wild West, Rome. He loves to do that, but it really has nothing to do with the story. His stories, as he said, are about the sufferings of little souls. They're always personal. So the fact that we have this splendid Christmas Eve scene is actually just a sort of an accident. Another scene with Christmas Eve is Werther, the final scene of Werther, and children singing Christmas songs is a very stark background to the tragic, dramatic ending of this opera where Werther, the protagonist, commits suicide, and Charlotte, his lover, screams out in, in shock. There it has at least a it, it has at least a, a dramatic function. It's a foil to have this music that is all about birth and about beginnings and the beginning about joy and peace and have it be a background to a very theatrical operatic suicide of a story that conquered Europe when Goethe first wrote that novel. So we don't get a lot of Christmas really on the operatic stage. And certain pieces were known as holiday pieces. For instance, Hensel and Gretel had a long history after its uh, premiere at the Metropolitan Opera in the late 1890s, many years, even up until my childhood, we used to go and see Hensel and Gretel at, uh, at Christmas time. But it again has nothing at all to do with Christmas. It just happens to be a fairy tale. And if I have to say it, it's a pretty grim things going on in, uh, in Humperdinck's Hansel and Gretel that even quest make me question, is it really a children's opera? From my point of view, it's, it's really an adult's opera based on a fairy tale, which is a little more common, having nothing again to do with Christmas. So if you are looking for traditional Christmas music, what are my big traditions? And I'm not going to give away too much about my talk on the podcast, but I do encourage you to visit me there at Conlon's Corner. What are the big pieces for me? Handel's Messiah, Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker, Bach's Christmas Oratorio. And then I'm going to uh, concentrate a little bit on two works which are not known to the general public. One is Franz Liszt's magnificent oratorio, Christus, which is actually three hours long and has three parts, but the first part is the Christmas story. It is called a Christmas Oratorio. And the other one is maybe my favorite, Berlioz, L'Enfance du Christ, The Infancy of Christ, which is a very particular take on the Christmas story, and I highly recommend it. I think it's time for me to wish you happy holidays, happy new year, have a healthy and safe 2021. And I will look forward to your questions on Coffee with Conlon and look forward to addressing you indirectly on my podcast in the Conlon Corner. Happy holidays. Happy New Year.